Washington Catholic Carol podcast. We've got stories you won't find anywhere else. I'm your host, Stacey Rausch, production coordinator. Today, we welcome Ken Balbuena, a parishioner of St. Bernadette Church in Springfield. He will be talking about his recovery from a ruptured brain aneurysm two years ago and how he is grateful to three special intercessors. Welcome to the podcast, Ken. Thank you, Stacey. It's great to be here. Um, Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what a brain aneurysm actually is? Well, brain aneurysm really is a weakening in the blood vessels. Some of the current research thinks that it might be hereditary, but essentially it's, uh, think about like a balloon. You're blowing up a balloon, and at some point, what happens to the balloon? It deflates. (laughs) Exactly, or it'll pop. Or it'll pop. So in my particular case, I had this weakening in my blood vessels. I had a balloon that just eventually popped, and I remember being at work one day, and it just it just happened all of a sudden. Some of the statistics show that it's about 40 to 47 percent of the people who have a ruptured brain aneurysm die within a 24-hour period, and the number is actually probably higher. Essentially, you either die or you don't. It's a very it's a, it's a very troublesome uh, thing that happens. But average age is about 54. For mine, I was 37. Wow. And it's more prevalent in females. Well, can you tell us a little bit about how you actually found out you had this ruptured aneurysm and like your story behind that? Yeah, absolutely. So most people get diagnosed with an aneurysm when it ruptures, according to what the, the researchers say. For my particular case, I was coming out of work at the St. John Paul II National Shrine in D.C., and as I was walking in the parking lot, I felt this pain just shoot across my head very slowly but steadily. Think about if you're peeling a sticker. Mm. It felt like that going from the left side of my head to the right side, My neck stiffened up and I couldn't turn it left or right. My ears clogged up like when you get off of a plane, but more intense and in both ears. And I felt this nausea that would just set in. Some people will black out. Uh, For me, I maintained consciousness the entire time. And I was aware of what was happening to my body, but had absolutely no idea what it meant when these were all happening together. Sounds very scary. Oh, absolutely was. You probably shouldn't have driven home. (laughs) I should not have, but my wife was, uh, my wife is a Girl Scout leader and I was on daddy duty. So I had to get home. And so I kept telling myself, okay, well, I I don't know what this is, but I I need to go home. And so I ended up going home and that's uh, where, you know, I really put my trust a lot in Father Michael McGivney. So the shrine where I work is owned and operated by the Knights of Columbus. I am a knight myself. So I'm familiar with Father Michael McGivney. He died when he was 38 years old. Mm. I was 37 when this happened, so I was close in age. But he founded the Knights of Columbus for people who were in my situation. They were you know, young, young adults, primary breadwinners, and had young families at home, so a wife and children. And so just immediately when this happened to me, again, I was very scared. I didn't know what it was, but I put my faith in Father Michael McGivney. And mm. I asked him just please father McGivney, keep me safe you know whatever you know whatever's happening here if you keep me safe and you can get me home i promise i will do whatever i need to do to get your story out there and i kind of pleaded with him a little bit and i was like yeah i'll, <laughs> Bargaining I'll uh, a little huh? <laughs> exactly <laughs> once that happened you you got home and then what like did you end up going to the hospital that day the next day well i called my wife on the way home and she just told me well it's probably a migraine so she wasn't, uh, she, she wasn't aware of what it was. I wasn't either. So as soon as I got home, she went off to her Girl Scout trainers, uh, Girl Scout um, leaders meeting. And I just you know, told the girls, I said, you know, girls, come here. I've got a, you know, at the time they were you know, seven, seven and like uh, four years old. So mm-hmm. I, I, told, I, I told my seven-year-old, I said, you know, hey, Anna, please, please come over here. Um, uh, I'm really, really sorry. Daddy's not feeling well. I need you to be a big girl. I need you to take care of your sister please go to bed by a certain time and yeah. just go play with toys, watch TV, but please, please let daddy sleep. Mm-hmm. And I tried really hard to sleep, but it was very difficult because I felt all this pressure in my head. And when I took the pressure off my head by elevating pillows, then it went down to my neck mm-hmm. and my neck hurt. And so when I tried to get the pressure off my neck, it went back up to my head. But somehow miraculously, I not only went to bed, but I, more importantly, I woke up the next morning. Yeah. And my wife had to teach a class at uh, Northern Virginia Community College where she works. And she said, okay, well, I've just got this class. I'll come home afterwards. I'll check on you and see how you're doing. And after class was over, I still was feeling just awful. And yeah. again, couldn't explain what it was. I knew it was not, not normal. I knew it was not, yeah, I knew it was not normal. <laughs> I knew it was not a, uh, you know, a migraine. So she said, well, you should call the doctor. And so I called the advice nurse first. 
she set up a video appointment with a doctor because uh, that was at my urging because I didn't really want to pay the copay. <laughs> but uh, ended up having a video appointment with a doctor at seven o'clock the day after. So it was well more than 24 hours wow. after it happened. And she stops me three minutes in, the doctor that is, she stops me three minutes in. She says, have you actually been seen in person by a doctor yet? Because if you haven't, we need to hang up the phone. I'm going to call the Tyson's uh, urgent care for Kaiser and they're going to be expecting you. I want you to go there immediately. And whatever you do, don't drive. Oh, wow. Fortunately, my neighbor next door was a retired nurse at Fort Belvoir. So she took me to the hospital. She took me to the urgent care at Tyson's while her husband came over to watch the kids as my mm-hmm. wife then joined us a little later. And when I got to the hospital, the Tyson's urgent care doctor there uh, did a CT scan on me. And she tried to re, you know, reassure me a little bit. And so she's rubbing my leg afterwards, and she's like, you know, well, you've had an aneurysm. Uh, if you don't know what that is, don't Google it. <laughs> um, she's again rubbing yeah, don't my scare leg. Yourself. Trying, <laughs> well, she's trying to reassure me, but I feel this like this worried, you know, voice. I hear this worried voice, and I could tell that she was just as concerned as I probably should have been. Yeah. And she's like, you know, just don't worry. You've had an aneurysm. You're okay. Um, most of the people who have about half the people who get this die, but don't worry, you're oh, no. fine. And I'm like, you're not really reassuring me very well but they did go and bring me to the the hospital and they checked you in then they checked me in then did another ct scan and the neurosurgeon who did the surgery the following day so now two days after it happened almost 48 hours he definitely did a great job on uh on repairing me and did a coiling procedure which runs a catheter from your groin all the way up to your brain oh, wow. and puts metal fillings, uh, like a metal, a very fine metal filament into your brain and coils it up and essentially patches it and prevents any kind of blood from seeping through. And at the time they found a second aneurysm uh, that they uh, said I should just come back within two years and get that taken care of, which I okay. eventually did. But the very, very first one was very, it's very nerve wracking because again, oh, yeah. I didn't know what it was, but as it relates to my faith, I did put my faith in Father McGivney to get me home safely. I remembered later one of my team members uh, at the, the shrine had told me that St. John Paul II's second miracle that was attributed to his intercession that led to his canonization was actually curing a woman of an inoperable brain aneurysm. Oh, jeez. And a Costa Rican woman. So, you know, JP2 was looking out for me. And of course, I work at the St. John Paul II National Shrine. So that really furthered my devotion to St. John Paul II and Mm -hmm. it really wanted me to to learn more about him and his teachings. And so it's not just a a job that I'm going to, but now I I have this close personal connection with him and he became my second intercessor. And who's your third? I know when you and I talked about this, you gave me, um, you know, several people that you pray to and pray to daily. Um, Who's that third one? So good question. So the third one Being a member of the Knights of Columbus, we pray the rosary often. Mm -hmm. And so Mary, of course, is someone that I turn to a lot, just like St. John Paul II did Mm -hmm. with his motto, Totus Tuus. Now with Mary, I was praying to Mary. I didn't know I was praying under a certain, uh, Mary under a certain title. I just knew that I wanted Mary to take care of me. And, you know, just like she took care of uh, Jesus as best as she could. Because of my job at the shrine, I had to go to a like an association of shrine leaders uh, convention that happened to be uh, Belleville, Illinois at a shrine called Mary, uh, it was called Our Lady of the Snows Shrine. Now, if you're not familiar with Our Lady of the Snows, that's a whole other fun story, but... Um, <laughs> that's I another didn't, podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't really think of anything about, you know, Mary of Our Lady of the Snows and going to that, but it was when I had the surgery that Our Lady of the Snows really became apparent. When I had my surgery, it was supposed to be a four-hour procedure. Ended up being two hours, Mm -hmm. and I wanted my rosary close by with me, and so they put the rosary in between my legs. It was my Knights of Columbus rosary that I've always carried with me uh, before this happened and ever since. Mm -hmm. So it was supposed to be four-hour surgery. Ended up being two hours, Mm -hmm. and within that two-hour window, it unexpectedly snowed outside. Oh, wow. (laughs) So I knew immediately that it wasn't just Mary, but it was specifically Mary under the title of Our Lady of the Snows. These three intercessors just all sort of came together. And after my recovery, after my surgery, um, I eventually came back to the shrine Mm -hmm. and told the story to some of the sisters of Our Lady of Mercy. 
And when I was talking to them, I told them about the three intercessors, Father McGivney, St. John Paul II, and then I said Our Lady of the Snows. And one of the sisters just kind of like looked at me very surprised. And she's like, Mm -hmm. well, why specifically Our Lady of the Snows? And I told her the story. And she says, well, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Our Lady of the Snows is actually the patron saint of her congregation. Oh, wow. All these (laughs) connections are starting to like kind of weave together, it sounds like, and really become apparent to you. It is all these connections that... You know, one off, they might be coincidences, but when Mm -hmm. you start to realize just how great God is and you start kind of um, putting these things together, you realize that God really does have a very divine plan Mm -hmm. that comes together beautifully in his own time. You know, I, I experienced all these different things at different points, but it wasn't until all this happened that I just realized that that God really does care for me. He led me in these various directions for a particular purpose. And through this divine revelation, I got to become a better knight. I got to become closer with Father McGivney. I got to have a deep appreciation for the work that I do every single day, promoting St. John Paul II and his teachings. And I got closer to Mary. And of course, Mary was, you know, she was very much known for the Holy Family. Mm-hmm. And that's also helped me, this experience has helped me to grow even closer to my family to really try and be more respectful to my wife and be closer to her and love Mm -hmm. her better, but also to really just take care of my kids and find the time to spend more time with them and play with them. And every single night when I go to bed now or when my kids go to bed, I make sure that we have this family prayer. Mm -hmm. And we say some of our typical prayers you'd expect to find, and the kids like, now I lay me down to sleep. And uh, But after we're done with some of our prayers, we always say, You know, St. John Paul II, pray for us. Father Michael McGivney, pray for us. Our Lady of the Snows, pray for us. Mm -hmm. And they're very much aware of why we pray for the intercession of these saints. And I try to always teach them that, you know, whoever your saint is, they're always going to take care of you and just have that faith in their intercession that they'll be with you. So they're aware of mine, and we always try to have them ask for particular saints and so it's a good evangelization and catechesis tool where i'm helping Mm -hmm. them to learn more about different saints and it probably would not have uh, been as strong or i would not have been uh, without this without this happening happening. wow um well how are you doing now like how has your recovery been um are you like 100 percent or pretty much back to where you were before the aneurysm i'd say i'm about 98 Mm percent back to where i was prior to the aneurysm i don't think i'll ever get the two percent back but that's okay you know there's there's you're here i'm here that's that's the important thing and i cherish life every day and that's obviously something that i would um, recommend to everybody is that Mm -hmm. they just realize the gifts that they have and that they're able to appreciate because we never know when life will just uh, expire. Well, I know I've known you for years, and it's really great that, you know, obviously you're still with us. Um, is there anything else you can kind of want to tell our listeners about, you know, this experience or any other kind of words of wisdom that you want to leave, leave us with? I think, as I said before, you have some intercessors, and you may not know who the intercessors are right away, but I'm sure that, the, that God will reveal who these intercessors are and who these important people, holy people are in your lives mm-hmm. in due time. Again, I had all these things that if you just look at them individually, you know, it's good stories, but they all really come together in this mm-hmm. beautiful divine plan. So I would say mm-hmm. my advice to the listeners are, you know, listen to what God is telling you to do. Don't just look at every thing as something that really doesn't make sense because it all does make sense. It just may not make sense in the time frame in which we mm-hmm. want to understand it. You know, God will make things known at a certain point mm-hmm. and it'll all come together very nicely and very beautifully. Great. Well, that's such a wonderful thing to end the podcast on. Thank you again for being here today. For more on Ken's story, pick up a copy of the September 12th print edition, where you can also read about the 40th anniversary of the Youth Apostles, a Benedictine sister who makes jams, jellies, and other tasty treats at the St. Benedict Monastery in Bristow, and the blessing of the new Divine Mercy University building in Sterling. For more inspiring stories, videos, and podcasts, go to catholicherald.com. This episode was produced by Stacey Rausch with production assistance by Elizabeth Elliott. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.